It's a great pleasure here to round up our morning's program. Thank you all for coming out on a gray and grizzly day in Newark. And I want to talk to you for a while now and tell you about memory, how it works, why it sometimes doesn't, and most importantly, what you can start to do now to improve yours. So, one of the first questions people often ask me is, how do I know if I have the early stages of Alzheimer's disease? Okay? And the easiest way to recognize somebody who has the earliest stage of Alzheimer's disease is when they've been told something over and over again, and they keep forgetting it. Okay? So, for example, all of you have been told many times at movies, in church, at events like this, to turn off your cell phone. <laughs> always, yes. there's going to be somebody with early Alzheimer's. <laughs> so, if during today's talk, a cell phone should ring, then I want you to help us in recruiting subjects by pointing, by pointing to the person and saying, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. Okay? And then we will round that person up and uh, control them in our study. And they will be so humiliated they'll never turn and forget to turn their cell phone off. Okay? So, let me tell you a bit more about how memory works. Because to understand Alzheimer's, to understand how you can improve your memory, you need to understand something about how memory works. So we're going to start with a memory experiment. And no, and you don't get paid for in there. Okay? So I'm going to read you off a bunch of words. Okay? And I want you to remember as many of them as you can. And this is a pencil down part of it. She ain't no writing down. Diane is our proctor. Okay. So, sour. Pay attention. Candy. Sugar. Bitter, good, taste, tooth, nice, honey, soda, chocolate, heart, heart, cake, Tart, pie. Okay, that's a 15. All right, now the question is, how good is your memory? How many of these do you think you could recall? Okay, so if I just asked you, I'm not going to ask you to do it right now, um, but just ask you, how many of those 15 do you think you could recall if I asked you just right now to list them all off? Easier than recalling is to recognize, okay? Is if someone shows you something, gives you a clue, and to ask you then, was this on the list, okay? So as you said, you said, now versus later. Much harder later, right? Yeah. So we're going to save the test for later. Something else now, okay? And then we'll come back later, all right? So let's talk about when memory fails, okay? False memory. Okay, a false memory is a memory for an event that never occurred. And you might think that uh, this would be hard to happen, but in fact, it's very easy to develop memories that are completely fictitious. So uh, a friend of mine, Beth Loftus, she did a wonderful study many years ago um, where she gathered people and got photos of their families and of their childhood and interviewed the people and interviewed their families. And one of the things that she would ask them is, has this person who we're going to study ever been up in a balloon? And they would say, no, absolutely not. As a child, never let him up in a hot air balloon. And then what they would do is they would take a picture of the child with his father, and these are the days before Photoshop, and they would cut and paste it into a picture of a balloon. Okay? So the child and his father had never been in a balloon, but they doctored up this fake photo, and they made a copy, and they put it back in with all the other family photos. And then unsuspecting, they, they sat them down and said, now tell me about some of your childhood memories. Let's go through these photos. And they would go through all the photos, and they would ask the person to tell stories. And then they would come to this photo, this fake photo, and after just three of these sessions, 
half of all the people not only could say, yes, I remember going with Dad up in the hot air balloon, but they would elaborate. They would know what they had for breakfast beforehand. They would say, oh, and I was so embarrassed I threw up when I was on it. I remember that so vividly. So here, are half the people in this study, okay, could be made to believe that something like this had happened. So it makes one, makes one say, ask the question, should we trust our memory? Doesn't. The study was done many, many times. So if, when you have a visual clue that you believe, it's easy, it just sort of clues you into it. If you think that something is true, if you see something that you think is evidence of it, your mind just creates a whole story to fulfill that. So the big question is you want to be really skeptical about memory. And then now that we've had a little bit of time to delay, we're going to go back and remember the quiz? Yeah. So now we're going to do a recognition. So I'm not going to ask you just to recall, I'm going to ask you to recognize. And so what I want to do is I'm going to read off some of the words that were on our list. And when there's a word that you saw on the list, I want you all to raise your hand. And when there's a word that's not on the list, I want you to keep your hand in your pocket. Okay? Are you ready? Okay. Dog. House. Candy. Dog. Tooth. Pie. Tomato, fast, sweet. Hold those hands. No, 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 no put one hand down. We got half, half the people here. Half the people have their hands up, right? Okay. Just being educated doesn't make you uh, resistant to this. These are students in Harvard who did essentially the same thing. They certainly even worse. Okay? So the bottom line here is memory can be very unreliable. Memory is malleable. Okay? Memories are constructed during retrieval using past knowledge, using expectations, what we think we're going to see, and false memories of all sorts, even innocuous ones, like sweet, okay? or memories of a childhood can be recreated to the point that we viscerally feel like they're true, but they're not. So, where do these memories get formed in the brain? And the most important memory structure, if you know one thing about neuroanatomy, the anatomy of the brain, is the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the most important memory structure for forming new memories. It's not so important for the old memories, but for putting down new memories is absolutely critical. And part of the way we know this comes from a man who had a terrible tragedy. He had epilepsy, he had seizures in his brain. And back in the 50s, people didn't appreciate how important the hippocampus was. And so they took out his whole hippocampus. And the good news was it solved his epilepsy. And that was important, because the epileptic seizures were going to kill him. Okay, there was no choice at that point to kill him, so they took it out. And what happened, his name for many years to protect his privacy, we're talking about ethics and research before, so when you talked about a patient, you didn't refer to him by name, you referred to him by initials. He was known as H.M., one of the most famous patients in memory. He died just a few years ago when the New York Times did a front page obituary and finally revealed his name. His name was Henry Morleus. And Henry could remember, he could remember everything up until 1953 was totally normal. Okay, so it wasn't his old memories that were gone. He could carry on a conversation. He seemed to be quite intelligent, okay? But he couldn't learn any new facts. He couldn't remember anything. The doctor who began to treat him after his surgery, for 20 years, he could never remember her name. And although eventually he thought she might be familiar, if you asked, how do you know this doctor, this person? He said, well, I think maybe we went to school together, okay? So he could not remember. He described his life as always that, like that moment when you just wake up from a dream and you're not quite sure what's real and what just happened. That's what his life was like day in and day out. So, I know who I am, I know all about myself. 
I just, since my injury, I can't make new memories. Everything fades. If we talk for too long, I'll forget how we started. The next time I see you, I'm not going to remember this conversation. <laughs> I don't even know if I mentioned before. So that's, that was from the movie Memento. That was a Hollywood depiction of amnesia. And it's exactly what it was like. You could never remember anything that had just happened. So studies of people like uh, HM and by animals and so forth have told us that the hippocampus is critical for processing new information. It determines what goes into memory and what doesn't get into memory. And in this way, we can think of it as something like the gateway to memory. It's what stands between the new events, the new experiences that are happening in your life moment by moment and what gets stored in memory. So, what happens to our memory when we age? Okay. So, just briefly, healthy, ugly adults retain most of their old memories. Where you went to school, your old childhood friends, all of these old things that, that you've sort of accumulated over the years, they tend to be pretty resistant to age. They stay. But the biggest problems that people have with aging um, is learning new facts, learning new memories. Where did I park the car? Was that on Martin Luther King Boulevard or Warren Street? Was that today and I said I was going to come to this event in Rutgers or is that next week? Okay? These things that you've just learned, these are the things that come in one ear, don't stick in the hippocampus and sort of fall out the other side. Okay? So it's the hippocampus, this gateway to memory, which is often failing as we age, and it's what's the most important to keep strong to avoid Alzheimer's. So let's talk about Alzheimer's. Okay, it's one of the scariest words to people who are 50 and above. Okay, let me just ask a question. How many people here have someone they know well, a family member or a close friend, who's had Alzheimer's disease? Wow. That's even more people that messed up on the false memory exam. It's over half the people. So that just tells you, in this group alone, half of you have been touched by someone you know, someone you love with Alzheimer's. So let me tell you a little bit about what Alzheimer's is. So the first question people ask, other than, am I going to get it, is what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Are they two different things? Are these two diseases? Well, let me explain what they are. Is that dementia is the symptom. Dementia is the loss of the ability to think and to reason and to remember. And there are many things that can give you dementia. Alzheimer's is a disease and it's the most common cause of dementia. So when people talk about Alzheimer's dementia, they're referring to the dementia, the loss of thinking and higher reasoning that comes from having Alzheimer's. So, dementia is the severe loss of higher cognitive function, and Alzheimer's is just one disease, it's a degenerative disease. And degenerative means it gets worse day by day. Okay? So some diseases, you just have it and it stays the same. Degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's get worse and worse. And you can see there on this graph that there are many different ways to get dementia, Parkinson's, uh, stroke, trauma, but Alzheimer's is the most common. So what is Alzheimer's? What makes Alzheimer's different than just other forms of memory loss or aging? And what defines Alzheimer's are two things that are, you can't see. They're inside the brain, they're called plaques, and plaques are outside the neurons. The neurons are the cells in the brain. And tangles are the, that are the problems inside the cells. Okay? So in Alzheimer's, you've got bad things inside the cells and bad things outside the cells. Okay? The plaques, these are called amyloid plaques, are deposits that are outside the neurons and they kill everything around it. It's like a toxic environment. And you see these throughout the whole cerebral cortex, throughout the brain, throughout everything there. But inside the neurons are the tangles. And the tangles are part of the proteins that are like the, the beans and the wood that's inside the wall to keep your house up. And if termites get them, if those, if those beans and everything start to fall down and get disintegrated, then the whole house is going to sort of collapse on itself. And so these tangles, often called neurofibrillary tangles, are the structure of the house, of the cell, collapsing in on it itself, and the whole shell sort of shrinks like a house that's been sort of imploded. Okay? You find these mostly in the hippocampus, okay, our key brain region for memory. So, this is what's happening inside the brain. If we look at the brain from the outside, you don't need to have a special degree to notice that the brain on the right is not good. The brain on the right is shrunken. You can see all the little spaces between the folds in the brain are bigger. The whole thing is sort of shrinking in and collapsing on itself. 
So let's talk about Alzheimer's in America. So right now there are about 4 million people who have Alzheimer's. It affects 1 in 10 people between 65 and 75. And of people over 85, half of people have the beginnings of Alzheimer's. So very much associated with old age. It's the fourth leading cause of death due to disease for those over 65. And the current cost over 100 billion annually. So it's a major problem today. But what about tomorrow? Okay. Well, one of the things we know about our, our population, our baby boomers and our aging, is that America is growing older. That the increasing aging population, the percent of people 65 and older, is getting greater and greater and greater. And as that grows, as the number of older people grow, Alzheimer's is going to become a bigger and a bigger problem. Okay? Here's an example from the future. This is how many people we have with Alzheimer's now. By 2050, which seems like massively in the future, but it's actually not that far away. Okay? That far away, we're going to have three to four times the rate of Alzheimer's if there's nothing special extra done. Okay? The way things are going now. So, let's talk about Alzheimer's. Let's talk about current treatments. So, there are many drugs that are on the market now. Okay, they're made by a number of different pharmaceutical companies. And they all have some effect. They're all, they all help a little bit. Okay? And that's why they're approved by the FDA, because there's some, they have some effect on improving function. But it's a small effect. And, but I'll explain what it does, I'll explain what these drugs do, and I'll explain what they don't do. So let's talk a little bit about what they do. To understand what they do, you have to understand how the brain communicates with itself. Okay, so they're neurons, neurons are cells, and the essence of thinking, of reasoning, of memory, is when one cell sends a message to another cell. And the way that works is a little electrical signal goes down the cell, and when it comes to the end of the cell, it triggers the release of chemicals. And these chemicals swim to the next cell, and at the next cell, they start the next cell firing again, and that cell communicates on. So it's an electrical signal, a little chemical swimming, and then another electrical signal. And this is the way information comes in, travels through the brain, forms memories, and allows you to express those memories by saying, I remember grandma. I remember where I left my keys this morning. Okay? So one of those drugs, one of those chemicals is called acetylcholine. Okay? One, of the critical, one of those critical chemicals for communicating in the brain. And acetylcholine is something that's lost in aging, it's lost in Alzheimer's disease. And as you begin to lose it in aging and Alzheimer's, there's less and less ability for one neuron to send a signal to the other neuron. Now, the brain is green in the sense that the brain recycles. Okay, just like you recycle your, your bottles and your paper, the brain, brain recycles chemicals. It doesn't have a lot of extra ones coming in. So after these chemicals have been released, they're a little Pac-Man, okay? They take the chemicals that haven't reached their destination, gobble them up, and take them back to the destination and sort of restock the first neuron. Okay, and these are called cholinesterases. And the cholinesterases grab up all the acetylcholine and they travel back to the original neuron and they put them back where they can be used for the next time to send information. And that's the brain sort of recycling of chemicals. Now, if you block these little Pac Men, if you prevent them from gobbling up the uh, the chemical, then more of the chemical can get across to the next neuron. So the way that most current treatments work is they take their little Pac-Man and they block them. Okay, that's why I show a little blocking signal. And by blocking those little Pac-Men from eating up the acetylcholine, they allow what acetylcholine you have left to be more effective. So it's not adding any of the chemical that you've lost, it's just letting the chemicals that you have there have a greater chance of getting to the farther shore. So that's what most drugs, not all, but almost all the drugs that are on the market, that's what they do. Okay. So, and it helps with fire. So this is, most of the drugs that you'll see, and I mentioned some of the brand names, this is what they're doing. This is how they're helping the communication in the brain, and for someone with early Alzheimer's or aging dementia, it can help improve a little bit of the brain's communication. Now you've noticed I didn't mention anything about plaques and tangles. So I defined what Alzheimer's really was, the core of it, and then I described the current treatments, and you realize that there's not an overlap between those two stories. And that's because these current treatments are boosting brain function a bit, and maybe they're giving someone six months or eight months of sort of better cognition, but they're not really affecting the underlying problem. So you can think about these cholinesterase inhibitors, they're helping, but it's like helping an old car that's got broken rings and valves and pistons by giving you an oil change. 
Yes, it will help it run a little smoother. It may keep it going for another 500 miles, but it's not fundamentally fixing the problem. And that's why pharmaceutical companies, research universities, medical schools are all working to try to find ways to fix these plaques and tangles, to stop them, okay? And to stop them before they cause dementia, okay? Because if you think about, and what, that's what makes it really important to get people early, because if you think about, I was talking about these tangles as being like the structure of your house, if the beams are all falling apart and the house collapses. Mm -hmm. Or imagine you come in with, and imagine it was termites that caused that. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine you came in after the termites ate the house, and that roof collapsed on the floor, and you sprinkled termite powder all around the house, and you said, it's not helping my house. Okay? Well, it's not helping your house because you're coming in after the damage has been done. You've got to sprinkle the termite powder long before the termites <coughs> eat away the beam. And it's probably going to be the same thing with Alzheimer's. The truth is, once someone has the advanced stages of dementia, it's like the, the cells have fallen apart. You can't go back and rebuild them. So what really is important now is early detection, is identifying the people who are healthy now, but, but are at risk for getting Alzheimer's in five years, who may be just beginning to show some of the signs and intervening. And it's one of the reasons why we're so interested in our lab here at Rutgers in understanding not what's happening during Alzheimer's, which may be when it's too late, but what's happening earlier on in the aging process. How can we identify the people early on who are most at risk for getting Alzheimer's? Because those are the people we have the most chance of intervening and helping and preventing them from ever getting Alzheimer's. So how can we predict who's going to get Alzheimer's? That's the real sort of important question, not only from a research point of view, but from ultimately from treating people. And right now, we can't, for sure. We can go in afterwards, we can do an autopsy and say this person had Alzheimer's, and it turns out that very often people who we thought had Alzheimer's Turns out they didn't have Alzheimer's. They had something else. They had vascular strokes. Or they had some other form of dementia. So a really important problem that our lab works on, one of the reasons we want to work with all of you, is to help understand how can we identify the people now who are healthy, who are most at risk for needed intervention. So how, given all of that, you can ask, well, what's my risk of getting Alzheimer's? Is there anything that I can do? Okay. Well, there's some things you can't do. The things that protect you from Alzheimer's are some of the things are, are not under your control. Being young, that's the best way. Being male, women have a higher risk of Alzheimer's. Having, choosing your parents, well, good genes. <laughs> if mom and dad, dad lived to 90 some odd, that's a good sign for you, okay? And the absence of mild cognitive impairment. If your mind is sharp now, that's a good predictor it's going to be sharp next year, okay? So those are non-modifiable, they are what they are. But there are other things that you can change that are within your power to make a difference. Okay, education, having a high education protects you from Alzheimer's. Vigorous participation in aerobic physical activity. And by aerobic, I mean your heart is pumping, okay? Your heart is pumping so much that it's hard to talk because you're really breathing hard, okay? So you want to be really vigorous activity. Mentally active, you want to keep your brain active, okay? Intellectually challenged diet. Margaret told you some wonderful advice about diet. She's going to tell more for those who stay for lunch. Diet is really important. And keeping low body weight. Obesity is a huge risk factor for Alzheimer's and dementia, as well as for diabetes and cardiovascular problems. So people who are obese have twice the risk of Alzheimer's as people who are slim. Okay? So these are, all, that's, these are all good news, because these are all modifiable. We all have the power to change something. Now, why Elian and, 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 and Margaret were talking about some of the, and Diane, about some of the reasons we come here to this community, this is our community, we're based here in Newark. But there's another reason that, that we do these programs here in Newark, is that African Americans have twice the rate of Alzheimer's as white people, which is the general population. Double the risk. And you might ask, why is that? Is it genetics? And the answer is probably no. Probably not, because in Africa, the rates are the same or less than they are in the U.S. Okay? More likely, people think, it's because of these modifiable factors. Okay? In the black community, now there are exceptions to everything, this isn't a stereotype that applies to everyone, but in the community as a whole, you have lower levels of high education, lower levels of vigorous participation in physical activity, through the aging, but then you have older levels, uh, staying mentally active, diet, there's often four issues of diet, which is sort of Margaret's life's passion to address. Okay, and body weight, you have a lot of obesity. So because of these factors are all elevated in the community, we see overall in the black community twice the rate of Alzheimer's. And part of our mission, and Margaret's mission and Diane's mission, is to understand this 
and to reduce it, starting here in Newark and eventually spreading out elsewhere in the country. And to help make that happen, we formed what Diane's referred to as our African American Brain Health Initiative, and is very much a university community partnership. It's not just us sitting in our laboratories doing research, it's working with the pastors and the deacons and the others, with the community centers, with the city, to make a partnership to understand these factors, to communicate them, to educate, and to change them. And Elian talked a little bit about research. Okay, he described these little forms to ask some of you to come participate. And we have two types of research studies that we're doing. One that we're starting now and one that's in the future. The first one that we're starting now is a study that we call Pathways to Healthy Brain Aging in African Americans. And we want to ask, at every age range, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, what are the factors, lifestyle, diet, genetics, uh, behavioral, what are the factors that predict who are the people who are going to keep their mental acuity absolutely sharp until the end, and who are the people who are going to sort of decline early? Because if we can begin to identify what are the risk factors, what are the predictors, then we can begin to go in and try to modify them. And that's going to be phase two of our study, because we're going to try to uh, raise funds at the moment to set up interventions, we call dancer size interventions, a mixture of sort of learning dance routines and being aerobically active. And we want to do research that shows whether we can take people who are at most risk for dementia and for Alzheimer's, and with a six month intervention of regular exercise, week by week, we want to see if we can improve their, their brain function okay, and their heart function at the same time and see if we can reduce that path. So those are some of our goals. And this is that, that sign-up form. Uh, we have lots of these sign-up forms. If you have friends or others you think might be interested, um, you can take them back and you can hand these in to our students or to Lisa. Where's Lisa Shalom in the back? She raised her hand. Lisa's our research coordinator. She's the one who will be sort of contacting people and following up. So let me just briefly summarize about Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is a degenerative disease. It has these bad things inside the brain, the plaques and the tangles. It causes dementia. It's particularly focused on the hippocampus. Current drugs are helpful, but they're not really getting at the underlying problem. And that's where the next generation of drugs are going to come from. And it's essential that we begin to understand these pathways to Alzheimer's, these pathways to dementia, so we can have early diagnosis and early interventions. And this community here is at a special risk and that's why we want to make some special effort to reach out. So that's sort of the essential information about Alzheimer's. So now in the last part of this talk, I want to talk about what can you do, okay? Now is the question is, now you know, now you're scared. Now you're scared of everything, okay? You're scared of all these things. Now after the part that says, I can go home tomorrow and I can make a change. So I'll talk now about six steps to a better memory. So the first step is to exercise regularly. And by the way, you may take notes on this part of the okay? Exercise regularly. Okay. People, people who are fit, people who are higher fit, have less cognitive decline, greater volume, greater amount of brain stuff inside them, reduce risk for cognitive impairments and Alzheimer's, and even if you start late in life, okay, even if you already have Alzheimer's, Physical exercise will improve your function, it will actually grow your brain. So this is an example, we talked about some of the studies we want to do here in the community, about six month interventions, that's six months of two or three times a week, 45 minutes of aerobic exercise. This was done by our, our collaborator and colleague, uh, Kirk Erickson from Pittsburgh, who we're going to work with here in Newark. A study he did in Pittsburgh showing, the yellow shows the people who exercise twice a week, okay? The blue are the people who just did sort of stretching and toning. They were sort of the comparison group. And six months later, you can see the changes in, in executive function. You're sort of you're thinking controlling. You're still to do spatial navigation. That's like getting here to campus when you're not getting lost. Okay? <laughs> Speed and processing. All of these things in six months would change. And our goal is to sort of try to replicate this and develop programs here in Newark. So we can sort of come back here in a year and show you graphs that look like this in Newark. The hippocampus, our favorite brain structure. What you see here is uh, the experimental group and the control group. The experimental group is the blue group, the exercise group. Six months later, th their hippocampus is bigger, okay? This is the size of the hippocampus, this critical brain structure. A year, people who kept with this program for a year, even a bigger effect, okay? So we can, with exercise, grow your brain. And not just grow your brain, but the critical brain structures. Further evidence, this is a graph, it shows along the horizontal side, it shows aerobic fitness. 
a measure of just how well your heart pumps blood to the brain, exactly the sort of things that Margaret has been talking about. And on the, the vertical axis, you see that uh, the size of the hippocampus. And what you see is the people who have the bigger aerobic capacity, the people whose, whose heart pumps most efficiently. These are the people with the biggest hippocampus. These are the people who are going to be most resistant to memory loss and the least likely to get Alzheimer's. So, how many people here feel motivated to go out and exercise after hearing all this? Okay. How many people are going to turn that motivation into action and actually go out? That's bad. Now, you might ask, okay, I've talked about drugs, I've talked about other things that have a little bit of effect. Exercise, if anybody asks for a magic bullet, people say, uh, if I take ginkgo biloba, if I eat blueberries, is this going to prevent Alzheimer's? Everybody wants a magic bullet. This is the closest thing to a magic bullet, okay? Physical aerobic exercise. Mm. And the reason it's such a magic bullet is it doesn't just do one thing. It does at least six things, okay? That, and all of which are important for memory. So exercise reduces stress, which we'll talk about later. It improves your ability to sleep, which is critical. It reduces your chance for strokes, which is part of what the ASA does. It reduces your blood sugar, which makes you less likely to have diabetes, which Margaret told you about. It increases the ability for neurons to grow and survive, and it increases the blood supply to the brain. So six separate independent ways in which exercise is going to help your brain. So the general conclusion is that exercise is brain power. Exercise has widespread effects on the brain. That even moderate intensity exercise, like vigorous walking, several days a week is sufficient for improving brain health. Okay, you don't have to go to the gym and do 45 minutes of of, you know, Jane Fonda, and so on and so forth. You know, just walking for 45 minutes at a brisk pace. Starting to exercise late in life is futile. And don't say, ah, oh, I should have done this when, you know, I was 20. Okay, at 50, at 60, at 70, you can start to have an effect. Okay? And exercise may have long-term health consequences for diseases of the brain, reducing stroke, reducing Alzheimer's. So, these are some of the reasons why exercise is brain power. So, lifestyle recommendation one from Rutgers, is get regular aerobic exercise and get your heart beating. And a reminder, there are a lot of people out there that say, hey, I'm a real sports fan, okay? I'm really into sports, okay? So, observation is not participation. Just because you're really into sports and you want what? That's not the same as being active in sports. So that hour or two that you're watching TV and watching somebody else getting a lot of aerobic exercise, if you turn off the tube and go out and do it yourself, that's going to do a lot more. So let's talk about keeping mentally active. So everybody in this room has done an important thing for keeping mentally active. You've come to a seminar. You've tried to learn new things. Okay? And that's the most important thing, learning new information. Coming here today and learning from all of us. Learning a new instrument, learning a new language, okay? Is a language you'd like to learn? Spanish, Tagalog, Portuguese, all sorts of useful languages, okay? Learning a new language, learning anything new. And the reason why I want to learn something new is because that's what engages the hippocampus, okay? So just doing things you know how to do doesn't help as much as learning something new. Being mentally active, always learning new information, cuts your risk for Alzheimer's in half. In fact, the data from mental activity is very much like the data from physical activity. You increase the volume, your brain grows, you reduce atrophy, you reduce that shrinkage, you create a reserve, okay? As you're learning new things, you're creating parallel pathways in the brain, okay? It's like knowing two ways to get to Newark from East Orange, okay? You shut down one road because of a flood, because of a barricade. If you're smart, you know another way to get to Newark, okay? If you only know one way, if you only got one path, you're sitting in the car dead, okay? And the brain works the same way. The more multiple pathways you have to get from one point to the other, the more you can resist, the more you can deal with the occasional breakdowns in certain aspects. So, lifestyle recommendation number 2A from the Rutgers is stay mentally active. Okay, whether it's Sudoku or whether it's playing chess, you want to use it because the alternative is to lose it. Okay? Look, here's another little fact totem from the science lab. For every additional hour of TV that you watch during your adult years, your risk of Alzheimer's increases by 30%. That's a scary fact. Now that either means one of two things. It either means when your mom told you it's the boob tube and it's going to rot your brain, maybe she was right. 
But more likely, it's not the TV itself that's rotting your brain. It's the fact that you're sitting there, slap jaw, having a beer, watching TV, when you could be out there learning Spanish or exercising. So it's a marker. It's, an, it's a marker for people who are not being mentally active or physically active. So I've mentioned learning something new, OK? So learning something new is the best thing to do. And one of the things that one can learn is to sing a new song. Okay. Now, I'm a little shy. Okay. So I need some help. So I have a couple of friends I want to call up. Pauline from New Hope. Okay. Alicia. something new, okay? We learn something new in several steps. You start by observing someone else, okay? Then you practice, often place by place, and maybe you practice with some hints, and finally at home you rehearse on your own. That, that's what we call at the university homework, okay? So we're going to start, first we're going to start by watching somebody sing something, and I'm hoping the volume is high enough, okay? karaoke style, okay? <laughs> okay? Okay, so we all want to go fast here. Ready? So we'll all sing together. One second. So here are the lyrics. Let's just go through them once rehearsed. Thanks for the same. Thanks for the memory of rainy afternoons, sweeping our own tunes, of motor trips and burning lips and burning toast in rooms. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine. Castles on the Rhine, the Parthenon and Moment Song, the Hudson River Line. How lovely it was. Okay, now we're ready to sing it along with Bob Hope. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
go. Now, back to the chart, it can teach us a few things about stress. Now, let's imagine back in the Star Trek days when the Klingons are attacking. Okay, Captain Kirk's at the front of the helm. The Klingons are attacking. This is a stressful situation for the USS Enterprise. So Kirk gives three commands to his crew. Okay, the first thing he says is release all unnecessary cargo. Okay, you want to save weight, you want the ship to be light, you don't want it to be burdened with anything else that it's carrying that it doesn't need. So release all unnecessary cargo. Shut down all non-essential systems, okay? Battle stations to everyone, okay? No cooking, no long-term repair, shut down the lights you don't need. Everything, everybody has to be focused on fighting the Klingons. And finally, the message goes down to the, uh, to the, to the uh, engine rooms. Give us warp factor seven, Scotty. Come on, Scotty. <laughs> now, what does Scotty say? Scotty says, she says, oh, but Captain, the dilithium crystals, they cannot take the strain. But Captain Kirk knows that dilithium crystals, they don't matter if the Klingons are going to blow us apart. That's right. So Captain Kirk says, damn the dilithium crystals, give me warp factor seven. And the ship sails on to another episode. So that's how Captain Kirk deals with stress of a Klingon attack. Now our body functions a little bit like the USS Enterprise. Okay? Now our body evolved over hundreds of thousands of years. Okay? And there weren't Klingons a long time ago when our bodies and brains were evolving. But what we did have were saber-toothed tigers. Okay? So body stress response is good. People say, oh, stress is bad. Okay, no, stress is good for some things. Stress is not an accident of evolution. Okay? Stress is exactly what you want when you're walking down the street and you see a saber-toothed tiger. Okay? That is a situation. And stress is like Captain Kirk telling you, we got to survive the next five minutes or nothing else matters. So what does stress do? The body stress reaction. Well, the first thing it does it does exactly what Captain Kirk does. It says, void all unnecessary cargo that you're carrying, which leads to a common expression, which I will not repeat, <laughs> to be really scared. Okay? Step two, shut down all non-essential systems. We're all about living the next five minutes. That means, don't, that means suppress your immune system. Okay? That's wasting energy. Suppress the menstrual system. Babies are for another day. Right now I've got to survive. <laughs> and sleep? I don't want to sleep now. Okay? Now these are all important things for long-term survival, for survival, for the species, for a person. But they're not important for the next five minutes. Okay? And finally, you want to ramp the brain up to warp speed. You have to recognize, you have to look around, you have to think about escape routes, you have to think about whether or not you can fight back. Okay? So your brain has to ramp up. And that's one of the really important things that stress does. In a situation like this, your brain goes to work factor seven. Okay? And that's great, that faster brain and body responses, focused attention, you know, your whole life is focused on the saber tooth tiger. Increased alertness, okay, you're absolutely alert to everything around you. That's why stress is good when you're facing a saber tooth tiger. But stress has long-term consequences, okay? Stress hormones set the, bra the brain to warp factor, but they're toxic to the hippocampus. Okay, that critical brain structure. Stress releases a chemical called cortisol, which stops the growth of new neurons. So, and all that great new neuron growth that we were talking about that we're trying to get by singing and learning and so forth, that stops. Stress decreases the hippocampus. It actually shrinks that, that structure we're trying to grow, to be big, to fight against Alzheimer's. That's going to shrink. <coughs> women are especially vulnerable. Women are much more, show many more effects of stress on brain function, possibly due to estrogen, possibly due to brain organization being different in women than men. So for women, especially a concern that stress is going to cause brain death. So there's, stress is good in the short term, it costs you in the long term. So in any kind of trade-off, what you have to ask, short term versus long term, you've got to ask, is this short term really worth it? Is it worth it? Damaging my hippocampus. If the answer is to get away from a saber-toothed tiger, yes. Okay. If you're on Martin Luther King Boulevard and somebody's coming around the corner and they're about to clip you, yeah, you want to be stressed and you want to jump at warp speed to the curb. Okay. But you want to avoid counterproductive stress. Okay. And exercise and sleep are both really helpful for that. 
So when unproductive stress begins, when you're stuck in traffic, when you call up you know, your accountant and he tells you what your retirement fund is looking like over the last six months, okay? This is all stressful. You worry about money, you worry about traffic. But none of these are life-threatening. And yet the bodies, we're, we're programmed for our body stress reaction to go into gear. So this is unproductive stress. These are the situations that aren't life-threatening in the next five or ten minutes, and this is where you want to reduce stress. So every time you start to be in one of these situations, and you want to think about what's happening to your brain as you're getting stressed, you want to imagine that there's a little Scotty down there saying, Oh, but Captain, the hippocampal cells, they cannot take the strain. <laughs> think about how many hippocampal cells you're willing to give up to go through the stress reaction to scream at the driver next to you. Four is get a good night's sleep. Okay, one of the things that our lab at Rutgers is really interested in is the effects of sleep on cognition. Because there's lots of evidence suggesting that sleep is really, really important for many things, especially for memory. So what is sleep doing for memory? Okay? So to explain that to you, once again, we'll go to an analogy. And it's not Captain Kirk. It's our shopaholic. Okay? Maybe some of you recognize this tendency. Where you go out, have all the shopping bags, and buy as much as you can. So what happens after a busy day of shopping? You've been out, okay, it's Black Friday, you bought all the things that are on sale, you come home, you're loaded up with shopping bags, and there are three things that you're going to do. You're going to review what you bought and organize it, okay, the dresses go here, the shoes go here. You're going to discard the excess, all that paper and the wrappings and the plastic and everything else, you're going to get that all up and you're going to throw that out. And finally you're going to put it away, you're going to say, well, I need to clear up everything that I've thrown out along my bed, in my living bedroom. I'm going to put the shoes in the closet, the dresses go here, and so forth. Now, when you've done all that, when you're finished reviewing and organizing, when you're finished discarding the excess, when you're finished putting away everything where it belongs, then you're ready to go out and shop the next day. <laughs> and that is fundamentally what's happening during sleep. Okay, sleep is a dialogue between the hippocampus and the cortex, the rest of the brain, where memories are stored. And what happens in the hippocampus during sleep is you're reviewing and organizing what happened. Okay? Think about dreams. Think about things being replayed in memory. They're being reviewed. They're being organized. Things that aren't that important. You don't remember everything from the 12 hours you're awake. Some of the stuff has to be remembered. Other stuff forgotten. It's as important to forget as it is to remember and to decide what to forget. All of that happens. And then it gets stored. Once the hippocampus has figured out what's important, it sends it to where it should go. And certain memories, visual memories, will go back here. And other memories, the hearing, the sounds, will go here. And bit by bit, everything gets organized so the hippocampus can start over again, a new day, learning new things. And if you don't sleep, if you don't get enough sleep, then not only will the things that you learned yesterday not get stored but permanently, but the hippocampus will still be sort of all mixed up and it won't be ready to learn again tomorrow. So sleep is important not only for what you learned the past day, it's important to prime you for the next day. And sleep is not just a single thing, awake or sleep. Sleep is this incredibly complex biological phenomenon. There are many stages of sleep. This is tracking someone through different stages of sleep throughout the night. And you can see they're changing hour by hour from different stages. And we now know in some of the research that we're doing in my lab at Rutgers is to try to understand these different sleep stages. Early on, you have something called slow-wave sleep, and that's stabilizing and strengthening and keeping the memory intact. But late at night, you have something called REM, rapid eye movement stage. It's what happens when you'll see underneath someone's eyelids, the eyes are flickering away. This is when, this is critical for extracting the importance of memory. And all of these different phases, each phase of, each phase of sleep is critical for a different function. So people who tell you, well, I'll just cut off the last hour and a half of sleep and I'll get six hours rather than seven and a half, they think they're only losing a small percentage of sleep. But what they're really losing is half of their REM sleep, because that comes at the end. So you can't just cut corners and, 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 and wake up an hour or two early. And the question is, how long should you sleep? And the answer is your body knows. Your body knows when it's had enough of sleep and it wakes up. So if your alarm is waking you in the middle of some deep sleep, that's because you haven't gotten enough sleep. So your body knows. Listen to your body. If there's one body message from all of this, listen to your body. So sleep, to summarize, sleep is essential for stabilizing, organizing, optimizing, and keeping memories intact. And what happens during sleep critically involves dialogue between the hippocampus and everything else in the brain. A short nap can improve memory. 
Yeah. And sleep disruption and aging and various diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's mm -hmm. are all part of what, what uh, impair memory. So improving sleep is a critical part of improving cognition. So lifestyle recommendation number four is sleep more at night and take naps. We're almost done. How many do we have? Six. Six. Two more to go. And then socialize with others. Well, you're all here today. You're all socializing. So all of you are doing well. I know many of you are involved in the local churches and the community centers. That's really critical. Living alone in midlife doubles the risk for dementia and Alzheimer's. Living alone late in life can triple your risk. Okay? Animal studies confirm that mice that are exposed to other mice have less of these bad plaques in the brain. Okay? And why? Partly it's because social interaction, intellectual stimulation are key to keeping mentally active. And friends are also key to brain health. And these are a couple of my favorite friends from here in the community. Some of you recognize yourselves. So friends are really key to brain health, and friends are really important otherwise. And I have friends that go all the way back to my childhood, and they're constantly telling me things about my childhood and my life that I totally forgot. So friends are really good to keep in round because they can fill in your memory gap. We met at nine. We met at eight. I was on time. No, you were eight. Yes, I remember it well. We dined with friends. We dined alone. A tenor sang. A tenor I remember it when that dazzling April moon. There was none that night, <laughs> and the month was June. That's right. That's right. It warms my heart to know that you remember still. The way you do. Oh, yes. <laughs> I remember <laughs> when. So, if you can't keep your old memory intact, the next best thing is to have an old friend with a good memory. <laughs> so, this brings us to the last of the six, which is to eat light and healthy. And Margaret told you a little bit about this earlier, and she'll tell you and show you more a little bit later. And as Margaret said, managing body weight, avoiding obesity is really important. Avoiding saturated food with high cholesterol. Margaret told you about HDL, the good cholesterol, it fights cell death. You want to eat brain and vascular protective foods, like dark fruits, like those blueberries and the blackberries, vegetables, broccoli, and so forth. You want cold water fish, things like tuna and salmon, because they're rich in something called omega-3. And nuts, almonds, pecans, walnuts, those are all good. And maybe some of these we're going to have for lunch today. So lifestyle recommendation number six is eat a brain-healthy diet. So that's the six steps to a healthy memory. Now this wouldn't be an accredited university if we let you out of a class without first giving you a final exam. Okay. So we're going to go through all six of these, and I want you to see if you can remember them in order. Now, I want to get to lunch as much as all the rest of you, so the professor's going to give a few hints. Okay, there'll be a picture to give you a hint. So everyone shout out number one is... Mentally active, mental active, avoid stress. Not so much. Avoid stress. Sleep. 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 So now you all get an A. Now, those are six things to remember. Now this creates a problem. Because what if you have, someone says in the back, I can't possibly remember all six. I have a memory disorder. That's kind of silly. You give someone with a memory disorder six things to remember, well, they're never going to remember it. So what are we going to do? So people ask me, I can't remember all six things. Is there just one thing, one thing I could remember, one thing I could do instead that will do me well? Okay? Well, exercise is pretty good. So is there one thing I could do which is 
the one thing I can do which will prevent, which will cover all of these different things. Okay? So, what I'm about to tell you now is homework. Okay? This is homework. Okay? It's not to be done here. It's not to be done during lunch. What this is the official verified Rutgers Newark method for memory enhancement and Alzheimer's prevention. You want to have frequent, ah. vigorous sex. <laughs> Someone is probably going to say to me, now, you didn't really get that prescription to run. You're going to explain, yes, yes, this really is the prescription, and it fits everything, almost. Okay? Right. It's vigorous for getting exercise. And it's an intelligent partner. It's going to be a little before and after conversation, hopefully. Sex releases stress. Okay? Sex, less stress. That old roll over and go to bed afterwards, you sleep much better. Okay? And finally, if you're doing it with a partner, you're socializing. <laughs> The socializing is really important. So this pretty much takes care of five out of the six. And then it's just up to you to have a healthy meal before or after. Uh, so that's the prescription. And uh, I want to thank you all. We're going to provide number six, the healthy meal, to those of you who are staying. The other five, you're on your own. Thank you very much. <laughs>